My name is Adam Minter, and I'm the author of Junkyard Planet, Travels in the Billion Dollar Trash Train. Uh, Junkyard Planet is the product of really a lifetime of being around uh, the global recycling industry. I grew up in a uh, downtown Minneapolis junkyard, quite literally. My family had been in the business since the early 20th century. And in the 1990s, uh, some of our scrap recyclables, the metal, started flowing to China. Um, in 2002, in a sense, I followed that metal to China when I had the chance to move to Shanghai to be a journalist there. Though I'd always known that uh, American recyclables flowed in, in big volumes into uh, Asia in general, it wasn't until I got to China and started covering the industry that I realized how big that industry was and how globalized it was. Without American recyclables, EU recyclables, Japanese recyclables, Australian recyclables, uh, China simply wouldn't have had the raw materials it needed to grow over the last 25 to 30 years. And so to do that, they've built industrial size uh, recycling facilities on scale that we've never had uh, here in the West. And I hadn't just reported in China, but also in India and across Asia, in Europe and in South America, to put together a book that really told the tale of how our waste, and by our waste, I'm not just talking about Americans, Europeans, I'm also talking to Chinese, Indians, you know, whoever uh, generates excess waste, how it's become a globalized commodity that's made our world a more connected place. It's the hidden backstory of our globalization, and ultimately it touches everything that we own, everything that we buy. The United States is the largest generator of recyclable waste, and China is the largest consumer of raw materials. So as a result, China, which simply doesn't have enough raw materials of its own, looks to the United States to supply it with a huge percentage of the raw material that uh, basically uh, powers its industrial growth. Um, at the moment, China is the world's largest importer of recyclables, the largest importer of American recyclables. At the same time, it's the largest consumer of things like copper, steel, plastic, paper, cardboard. So you have this marvelous synergy between the developed world and a developing country. Now we don't have a lot of data on workplace safety accidents, say in places like China, but just anecdotally speaking, uh, it's no secret that people are injured in these facilities in workplace accidents that might be everything from you know somebody being hurt, run over by a forklift to what I document in the book, uh, people inhaling plastic fumes as they're recycled in small plastics recycling workshops in Wenan, County uh, in Hubei province near Beijing, essentially plasticizing their lungs and inducing strokes at very young ages. You know, there's, there's a range of problems that go with this industry. At the same time, I think it's important to realize that all the problems that are there, um, you are still, in a sense, preventing problems as well. It's not a zero-sum game. You know, in the book I say the worst recycling is still better than the best mining. And I, you know, I haven't seen any comparative studies on what happens, say, in a nickel mine up in the, you know, the mountains of Tibet. But I can assure you that there are uh, serious accidents that occur in a place like that, just as there are serious accidents that may occur in a, uh, a Chinese scrapyard or an Indian scrapyard. In terms of the environmental issues, um, there's always going to be the issue of uh, water discharges. Uh, the paper recycling industry throughout the world generally generates a lot of effluent, and uh, more often than not, though it's getting better in China, but in India, for example, you'll see that effluent end up in rivers. Um, plastics recycling, there's fumes problems, uh, also problems with washing plastic. There's caustic agents. Again, in developing countries, there's oftentimes not the, uh, the, the facilities to actually clean that water. So those problems can be quite serious. We've sort of all been trained, if you will, even greenwashed into thinking recycling is sort of expatiation for our consumer sin. You know, so long as you throw the can into the recycling bin, you've done your good deed, you've all, all but put that uh, aluminum back into the ground. And of course, that's not the case. What you've done is consumed and, you know, put off the garbage man for a little while longer. But nothing is 100% recyclable. And slowly, as that aluminum can goes through the recycling process, more and more aluminum is lost. And eventually, you're going to have to dig another uh, a, a mine to, you know, provide the world with more aluminum. So the solution is not necessarily more recycling if you're coming at this from an environmental standpoint. The solution is sort of the first two tiers of the familiar reduce, reuse, and recycle pyramid. If you really are concerned about the environment and the impact of consumption on the environment, then the best thing you can do is reduce your consumption. 
that's not realistic for a lot of people. And I don't like to tell people in developing countries who have never had the chance to consume that really for the sake of our environment, please reduce your consumption. So the next step is reuse. And I think that's the positive step that most people can take. Perhaps the thing that most readers will find most surprising about my, about my book, if not counterintuitive, is the 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 way that I treat scrap laborers, I think a lot of us are accustomed when we see pictures of scrap recycling in developing countries, whether it's India or China, to look at uh, the people in these images as sort of downtrodden, um, enslaved, exploited, um, not really being of their own initiative, uh, the other. Oftentimes when I go and visit these recycling facilities, uh, you find that the laborers out in the scrapyard who are doing something that to most Americans, for example, looks like playing with garbage, are making more money than most of the new college graduates in the offices. And that's, a, to me, a really encouraging sign. And it also speaks to the level of skill that's needed to do a lot of that work. What I really hope to do with this book is add a layer of dignity to these people who are oftentimes uh, depicted without really any captions, leading people, especially in the West, to look at them in a way that doesn't necessarily give them their own uh, agency, if you will.